I'm going to talk a little bit about contemporary challenges to democracy in the United States. Um, I, I should say that I'm not just a uh, scholar in this area, but, but uh, you know, there's, a, there's a commercial in the United States that says I'm not just a customer, but I play one on TV or something like that. That I work in this area. I was the research director of the President's Commission on Election Administration. Uh, I often draw uh, electoral districts uh, for courts and then currently leading a, a task force dealing with campaign finance, in particular looking at issues of what happens when campaigning moves to the internet uh, and the transitions that happen uh, in that regard. But Frank Fukuyama at the beginning talked about how we've been looking at the United States in comparative perspective and it, because in general our, our chauvinism has led us to look inward. Uh, this is a more inward looking uh, presentation except to say that you know, yet the United States is uh, special and in some ways especially dysfunctional. Uh, and, and those unique features of the US which come from our general distrust of centralized authority and a suspicion of uh, sort of the inability to have nonpartisan supervision of the democracy really do separate uh, or, or they're distinctive about the United States. And we have what, what I've often called a kind of perfect storm of democratic dysfunction in the United States. Uh, which comes from our extreme decentralization of our electoral system. There is no right to vote, for example, in the US Constitution. Most people think there is. There is no national election authority that supervises elections. Right? It's all decentralized to the states and even further down to the localities in certain very important respects. At the same time, most of the people who are in charge of supervising the democracy are themselves elected according to on a partisan ballot, or they're appointed uh, by a partisan official. So that it wasn't, so for example, what happened in the 2000 election when resolving the controversy in Florida, for example, was that the Secretary of State of Florida, who was elected, also happened to be the chair of George Bush's campaign in Florida and was overseeing the electoral controversy in Florida. So that feature is, is endemic and characteristic of the US uh, political system. You see it in election administration, in redistricting, <coughs> where the incumbents, for the most part, draw the lines themselves for their own districts. And also, uh, with campaign finance, we have, in some ways, the worst of all worlds, where we have uh, what we call the Federal Election Commission, which has three Democrats and three Republicans on it, which has been described as an institution designed to fail. Uh, and it does so. Uh, with quite, you know, uh, with a plum. Uh, so <laughs> third, this might not be as unique uh, in the United States, uh, but we do also have the problem that at the point of contact for voters, uh, we have relatively untrained volunteers in the polling place. And as I go through the different types of legal restrictions that affect democracy <laughs> in the US and how complicated American democracy is, the fact that we have people who are the point of contact for voters who are maybe have four hours worth of training does have a uh, considerable effect on things like the long lines on election day that we saw in 2012 and 2008. Finally, um, we have more elections than any other country in the world, more elected offices uh, than any other country in the world. The, you know, the, the, the proverbial dog catcher gets elected in certain jurisdictions. We still have elections for the coroner in certain areas. If you come to California, California the ballot pamphlet is a small novel that you have to read in order to figure out all of the uh, types of uh, offices. This is, related to this, is also a feature that I don't think people talk about enough in the United States, which is related to the fact that we have these very long campaigns, and that is, unlike most countries in the world, uh, we have fixed terms. And so the fact that we have a two-year campaign for the presidency of the United States is, in part, a function of the fact that you can't just call an election at any time in the US, that you have uh, sort of these uh, longer term uh, regular elections for most of these offices. All right, I'm going to talk very quickly um, about the particular domains of democratic uh, uh, contestation and, and, and controversy lately. Uh, just talk about three in particular, just to highlight uh, the areas and talk about a lot more. But just to give you a sense of where the controversies were and where they are now. For the most part, if you had to have an overarching theme, it's that the law of democracy in the United States had historically been characterized by the fight for African American voting rights, right? In particular in the South. What has changed in the last 50 years is that there's been a move from focuses on race, though we've continued to do so, to issues of political party 
right? And, and it's not that we have, have lost uh, the, the fights with respect to civil rights and uh, the protection of the rights of racial groups, but they have now been sort of joined with particular concerns about uh, one party entrenching itself at the expense of another. So in the area of voting rights, historically it was about poll taxes, literacy tests and the like. Now we have fights over voter identification laws, shortened voting periods, restrictions on voter registration, and then long lines on election day. Redistricting, the drawing of district lines, which historically the concern had been about districts that were of unequal size uh, and anti-minority gerrymandering, trying to discriminate against uh, racial minorities with the way you drew lines. Now there's concerns about parties entrenching themselves at the expense of outsiders, uh, as well as issues of pro-minority gerrymandering. <laughs> Finally, campaign finance, where the uh, originally the uh, issues for the last 40 years have been over individual rights to contribute and spend money now uh, after what's, I think, a uh, case many of you may have heard of called Citizens United. Uh, the concern in the US is over corporate spending and then just sort of large individual expenditures and contributions. So let me just give you a taste of each of these controversies and we could talk more about it in the question. So just as an example of the issue of uh, voter identification as a lens through which you can see the concern about partisan entrenchment through the enactment of election laws. Um, this is a, a phenomenon and a controversy that arises out of the 2000 election. And in part, the, the way we think about US democracy has been sort of poisoned by the closeness of the 2000 election, where now everybody thinks that every election is going to be decided by 500 votes, right? even for the presidency of the United States. And so uh, something like voter identification, this controversy, which was never an issue, then rose out of the ashes of the 2000 election to now really divide the political parties. In some ways, it's a metaphor for all the other kinds of changes that are happening in the electoral system. And you can see what has been happening around the US so that mo for the most part, these restrictions, you, the red areas are places that are governed by Republican uh, legislatures uh, on the left and on the right are areas that have new voting laws since the 2010 election. There's a pretty tight correlation between Republican control and uh, new enactment of new voting restrictions. And remember, as I said, everything is decentralized in the United States, so state laws uh, make a big difference. Um, with respect to redistricting, as I said then, it used to be about malapportionment and anti-minority vote dilution, trying to go after minorities with the way you drew lines. Uh, now it's more about parties, and, and there's some other new issues dealing with pro-minority districting. In my sort of evangelical role as an American to try to explain uh, concepts that have, have left our borders, I wanted to show you what the original gerrymander was. Okay, so the word gerrymandering came out of this district in northern Massachusetts that Elbridge Gerry drew, who was the governor of Massachusetts. And when a newspaper reporter saw that, said someone next to him said, that's a salamander. salamander. He said, no, 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 that's a gerrymander. <laughs> and this is the original picture of the gerrymander. So you can see the, um, the dragon that resulted. But what was that issue there? What's that issue there was, uh, the, you know, the, again, the, the deliberate grouping together of your political opponents mm -hmm. um, in order to minimize their political uh, power. Um, that spilled over, and for much of the 60s, we were talking about in the context of race, so that, for example, the city of Tuskegee, which used to be a square, was they then excised over 99% of the African Americans in Tuskegee by creating, redrawing the city lines to be that yellow shape on the right. Okay. And now the controversies have, have spilled over into the question of how often can you take into consideration race in the re redistricting process. So if you look at these pictures, these are all congressional districts that were then struck down by courts uh, in the 1990s um, uh, as being excessively based on race in order to draw safe majority African American and majority Latino districts. As you, you know, I, um, I didn't draw any of these, I should say. Uh, but that, you know, you ought, as was once said about this district in North Carolina, if you, drew down, if you drove down the district with both of your car doors open, you'd kill half the people in the district. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is characteristic, again, of, of, of some of the lack of constraints in the um, drawing of uh, districts. But as I said, now the, the concern has to do with uh, partisan gerrymandering in no small measure. Because of Republican control in uh, many of the battleground states, they were able to draw districts favorable uh, to the political party. I should say that 
even it, districting itself in the United States favors the Republican Party because Democrats live in large cities and uh, they're inefficiently dispersed in the population uh, so that there is a natural bias in simply that even if you were to draw kind of square coherent districts there's a natural bias against uh, Democrats. One thing I want to highlight for you because it will be in the news this year is a new case the Supreme Court is taking over whether you should be drawing districts around people or around eligible voters. And so I filed a brief on uh, behalf of myself, Bruce Kane, and some others two weeks ago in this case. It has huge implications for Latino minority representation uh, in the US. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of some of the partisan gerrymanders, again, this is North Carolina uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Pennsylvania. You can see it's like some of these districts that, that are in place right now. Uh, the Democrats do it as well. They've done it in Illinois. They've done it in uh, Maryland. Now let me just end with campaign finance. So uh, the, the view in the, the, the United States is that Citizens United has sort of changed the paradigm of, of campaign finance. That's not exactly right. Um, for 40 years, you've been able to spend, an individual has been able to spend an unlimited amount of money uh, supporting candidates for office. They were not able to give that money in contributions, but we, make a diff we see a difference between spending on the one hand and contributing on the other. What I want to highlight, though, with Citizens United, it was not a case about corporate political advertisements. And it was a, it was a case about a movie that you could download off of on-demand programming. That, that gets lost in the discussion, but it's, it's something that we need to pay attention to because it presages the future of campaign finance, not just in the United States, but elsewhere. And that is the, what happens when television is no longer the main mode of communication for political campaigns. The ability to regulate. Uh, Campaign communication on the internet is something that every country is confronting right now and it's going to be uh, really uh, problematic. I'm working on this project, as I said, in Silicon Valley with a lot of the platforms like Google and others to try to figure out what should be the norms uh, that should govern uh, political communication on the internet. I'll say, uh, I'll end with what we in the United States call the election administrator's prayer and in, pre in uh, preparation for 2016. Given all of these controversies and all of the, the sort of stakes, uh, you know, Dear Lord, whatever happens, please do not let it be close. Because when it is, also the fragile underbelly of American democracy then comes out into full view. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, a pleasure to be back here at CEU, and I'm very um, thankful for uh, the invitation, but I'm going to be speaking about something a bit different, um, uh, a different spin, if you like, on the notion of hollowing, uh, which I'm going to view through the lens of uh, anti-politics and depoliticization. Um, and also I'll be addressing it in a different domain uh, in the sense that I want to look at uh, transnational governance. So when I'm thinking about or talking about uh, depoliticization uh, in transnational governance, it's very much about emergent processes rather than established institutions that you see within nation states. So it's very definitely about one of the frontiers, if you like, of uh, democracy that you see over my shoulder. So I'm not addressing elections or parties or government. Um, instead, I think one of the questions that we should be asking about uh, democratic voice and participation is about the new spaces that are emerging above the nation state. And in particular, how we might think about building in uh, processes and practices for uh, democratic deliberation. Uh, so depoliticization, what do I mean by that? Um, the way in which it's been uh, developed by various scholars, mostly uh, in Europe, is to refer to it as a form of statecraft. So a deliberate process of hollowing out, uh, where state managers uh, retain arm's length control over crucial economic and social processes, whilst uh, at the same time benefiting from the distancing effects of depoliticization. So various reforms that have taken place in public sectors since the 1990s um, of OECD states, um, seeking uh, greater technical efficiency, uh, means to um, enhance managerial autonomy of bureaucrats, uh, and break down the resistance of powerful groups of employers and workers. Uh, a, a range of reforms that are often put under the label of 
uh, the new public management. Now, uh, I mentioned it's a form of statecraft. It has generally been applied at the nation state level, but I think you can also see this kind of dynamic of technocratic and managerial control uh, at the international uh, level and in international organizations, um, which are interested in uh, developing, not just by themselves, but in conjunction with various kinds of expert communities, um, consultants, scientific experts, and think tanks to develop um, practices and procedures around um, best practice, international standards, and various metrics of uh, development or corruption control or poverty allevi uh, alleviation. So the development of these standards and practices is part of a, de a technocratic exclusion of wider societal voices in international institutions and transnational uh, policy networks. Um, that's not to say it's an inevitable process, and uh, the development and growth of global civil society over the past couple of decades has been diverse and quite proactive. So the person who asked the question earlier about um, are there different understandings of democracy, I think, yes, we are seeing different forms of understanding about where democratic processes uh, can be, or democratic voice can be articulated through various kinds of social movements or through transnational advocacy networks um, and individual civil society uh, organizations. And we've already seen some notable successes from civil society uh, with bodies like the International Campaign to Ban Landmines or the advocacy that was done uh, a decade or so ago on dirty diamonds that led to the Kimberley uh, certification regime. So civil society is quite important in helping repoliticizing um, many issues. And we can see uh, new developments also. Um, that have been facilitated by advances in um, information technology through crowdsourcing, Twitter campaigns, Facebook activism, and portals like uh, Open Democracy, which provide new ways of uh, engaging uh, cross-nationally. Um, but civil society is not without its uh, critics or its own power hierarchies. And while the uh, elite government corporate dialogue of the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, might be correspondent uh, with an alternative uh, approach of the other Davos, of Port Alegre and the World Social Forum, uh, the vast majority of civil society organizations are poorly resourced and often operate without the um, professional uh, protocols of the larger non-governmental organizations and uh, business associations. But what I want to concentrate on uh, is transnational ad administration and new forms that are emerging of administration, um, where citizens and citizenship are anomalous categories, uh, in that citizens are at a, a vast cognitive distance from transnational policymaking dynamics and face high barriers accessing global and regional institutions. And this distance uh, is um, one of the foundations of a globalized anti-politics. And anti-politics here I'm, I'm uh, thinking of as one of the discontents of uh, democracy. And it refers to and has been developed at the nation state level um, as a disengagement and disenchantment with traditional forms of political organization and participation when citizens don't join political parties, don't vote, don't trust politicians, feel alienated, and feel that government is powerless to effect meaningful change. Uh, but thinking about transnational administration, uh, you can also see a disengagement and a discontent um, which is brought about by the distancing effects of the devolution and delegation of public action to semi-private arenas of policy making. And one of the problems here is that even before apathy can set in is that public awareness and comprehension 
of the, of the variety of transnational administration uh, arrangements and processes that have emerged uh, is foreshortened by um, the relatively elite and rarefied nature of their deliberations. And I will get to a few examples of these uh, types of bodies in a moment. Um, so rather than just looking at the traditional international <coughs> organisations like the World Bank or the IMF or uh, the U uh, various agencies of the UN, um, there has been actually a much greater proliferation of global public-private partnerships, uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives and various transgovernmental uh, networks, uh, which are very fragmented. Um, and this fragmentation, kind of like a hollowing, uh, is also cultivating disinterest amongst um, communities and societies. Uh, and is compounded by a paucity of so societal mechanisms for everyday um, members of the community to map uh, or monitor and measure their roles in global uh, regulation and soft law development. So what do I mean by uh, fragmentation? Uh, here I draw on a, a, a British scholar called Colin Hay who describes this uh, fragmentation of three different types. First, a depoliticization that involves moving an issue um, from the governmental sphere into the public sphere. Secondly, a depoliticization of moving issues from the public sphere to the private sphere. And then another tactic of uh, depoliticizing uh, things by uh, developing a discourse or a framework of saying, there is no alternative, Tina, in a sense. That it's, uh, there is a very fatalistic approach um, to understanding how to deal with um, public problems. So transnational depoliticization is a governing uh, strategy that disperses uh, governance, and it can be done through at least four ways. Horizontally, through intergovernmental networks between government officials, working at the same cooperative level. So this would include um, the Financial Action uh, Task Force, which is uh, a network of uh, regulators concerned with money laundering. Um, four countries conference of chief executives of electoral agencies from Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the UK. Or GLOBE, a new one, uh, International Global Legislators Organisation for a Balanced Environment. So this is um, horizontal in the sense that it's between uh, nations. But it can also be <coughs> a vertical dispersion through transgovernmental uh, networks. Um, I'm from Australia, so the ASEAN Committee on Migrant Workers, working with the ASEAN Secretariat, but also various countries uh, in the ASEAN community. Or just last um, July, uh, the UNDP and the OECD um, with some uh, lack of imagination, launched the Tax Inspectors Without Borders Network. <laughs> <laughs> yes, lack of imagination. But again, this is vertical in the sense um, of working with uh, two international organisations that then work with um, uh, national officials. Uh, a diagonal dispersion across the public-private divide where you have partnerships, global public-private partnerships um, between international civil servants and government officials uh, with private actors to see things like one of the best known is Gavi, used to be called the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunisation, which is funded by, or was originally bankrolled by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Could be the Global Water Partnership or the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And then another uh, feature of dispersion is that you have private regimes. Um, Well-known ones would be the bond rating uh, agencies like Moody's and Fitch, or uh, the International Standards uh, Organization, or ICANN, for assigned um, names and numbers, which perform global roles of accreditation and coordination. And one minute, I'm nearly there. Uh, but it can also include the big philanthropies like Gates, Open Society Foundation, Ford, Arthur Khan, amongst others. 
So these four dispersions uh, to quasi-public transnational policy communities, uh, I would suggest constitute um, the development of a global public sector, or what has been described by uh, others, um, Benedict Kingsbury, as a discernible global administrative space in which the strict dichotomy between domestic and international has broken down. Now, I only gave a few examples, but there are hundreds upon hundreds of examples that I could um, uh, introduce now. Um, so these are public spheres of policy active activity, which can be filled out with democratically informed practices and procedures, or they can remain relatively hollow in the sense of there's lack of public awareness about them, the governance arrangements uh, for many of these uh, networks are in evolution um, or, or somewhat truncated. But I want to finish um, by suggesting that yes, there is a, a, a problem, uh, but depoliticization of transnational administration is by no means uh, inevitable. And uh, states will continue to uh, be extremely important uh, players potentially to democratize or at least make these kinds of spaces, administrative spaces, more accountable and more uh, legitimate. And finally, by using uh, the language or the framework of uh, anti-politics and depoliticization, de I'm giving a negative or critical spin on what could alternatively be seen in a positive light as well, in the sense that there are many plural spaces that are being created uh, for which, which represent many different target points um, for uh, public action, uh, for alter globalization resistance, and uh, experimentalist governance you know, as a creative pro uh, process to deal with uh, collectively um, transnational problems that we face. Thank you.